Hello. Welcome back. All right, let's talk about part do or two of the axial skeleton. What I want to go over today is this guy. Mm -hmm. The vertebral column. And uh, we'll talk about, uh, real briefly, the thoracic cage. I'm not going to say much on the thoracic cage. Um, in this portion, part two, this is going to be really short. The first video was really long, so hopefully you got through it. Pretty tough to get through, but, you know, you can break it up. You got all week. Um, this, uh, this week, or this, uh, this, this part two video here, uh, it's going to be relatively short. I'm going to go very brief through uh, the anatomy of the vertebral column. Um, and I'm probably going to switch on over to the PowerPoint here just because it's easier. I mean, it's going to be hard for me to lift this. I got a bunch of uh, little tiny vertebrae that I pulled from the lab, but then I thought, what am I just going to, you know, hold it up to the camera? I don't know. It's not going to come out too well. So that being said, I just want to briefly go over uh, this and then show you kind of how this all just sits. You know, this is a, a replica, obviously. This is made out of a composite material. Um, but I do want you to notice that uh, the shape, okay? And I want to talk about that real quick. Uh, so, you know, we're going to go over multiple times in this, uh, the divisions of the vertebral column, okay? We have the uh, cervical division, the thoracic, and the lumbar. And most of the time, most people that are new or human anatomy is foreign to them, they've at least heard the term lumbar region or lumbar spine, uh, mostly because 70% of Americans call out of work each year because of uh, lower back pathology or lower back pain. Uh, in my clinic, or the clinic I used to have, um, I would probably treat on an average week four to five patients uh, for lower back pathology rehabilitation protocols, okay? So quite a few, and there's a lot of clinics in town that specialize in just that. Um, first of all, the purpose of the spine, okay? One of the main purpose is uh, for us to be able to uh, provide sensory and motor information all the way uh, down and throughout our body, okay? It houses our spinal cord, and our spinal cord kind of just runs in the middle along the spine behind the vertebral bodies. That's what these bigger parts are called. We'll go into the uh, exact anatomy with a picture here in a minute. Um, but behind these vertebral body bodies, so just posterior, this is the anterior surface. So everything right here is kind of our stomach area, um, our abdomen. You can see on this guy here. Okay, so all of this on the anterior aspect here, um, this is going to be our visceral cavity uh, or our abdominal cavity. Uh, so like I said, posterior to the vertebral bodies, we have the, the spinal cord that runs through here. That's a large bundle of nervous tissue. Uh, right about here, about this uh, lower portion, right at what we call the thoracolumbar junction, that spinal cord uh, turns more into uh, strands of spinal cord, and we call that the cauda aquani. Cauda aquani, okay? Basically just means horse's hair in Latin, uh, but that's the term that's way back when we were, as human beings, defining uh, anatomical structures. We named it that. Um, each region has a tiny little hole that this nerve root comes out, okay? If you've ever heard anyone say, oh, I have a slip disc or I have a herniated disc um, or something like that, uh, or a bulging disc, uh, nine times out of ten, the disc, which is these cartilaginous structures in between the vertebral body, okay, these uh, allow the spine to be work like a link, a chain link, and be able to move, okay? Um, one of the problems of the human body, though, is that uh, these discs tend to protrude outwards, okay, or protrude out. Uh, and specifically, there's a tissue in there that protrudes out. That tissue uh, is called the nucleus pulpus, okay? 
And I'll kind of draw that on the board because that's an important aspect that we kind of run over and skip. But I do want to teach it to you because if you're planning on going to AT, OT, or PT school, right, as an athletic trainer, occupational therapist, um, physical therapist, maybe even a recreational therapist, um, you're going to be dealing with uh, damage to the intervertebral discs, okay? Guaranteed. So uh, that tends to bulge out the back or uh, off to the side in the back. So we call it a posterior disc herniation or a posterior lateral. If it goes into the spinal canal, that's called a posterior disc herniation. If it kind of goes up against the nerve root, which is these guys right here, presses up against the nerve root, that's called a posterior lateral uh, disc herniation. It can go on either side. One of the reasons why it does that is because on the posterior aspect of the vertebral body, there's a ligament. It's called the PLL, posterior longitudinal ligament. Now, uh, let me pause here for a minute. None of this stuff is on your test. Okay, but I feel it's really important for you to know, especially if you're going to be a healthcare provider. So if you don't want to hear this, you can kind of just skip ahead and get to the important stuff that's going to be on your test. But if you want to learn a little bit and some cool stuff, why lower back pain uh, is felt among 70% of Americans, this is why. Okay, or one of the reasons why. So that PLL, posterior longitudinal ligament, runs on the back side of the vertebral column. Up near our cervical spine, it's pretty thick, but as that starts to come down, for some reason, and maybe it has to do with the kata quanai or whatnot, I don't know. The answer may be out there. But for some reason, this PLL, posterior longitudinal ligament, becomes real thin back here, okay, especially in the lumbar spine. And as that becomes thin, thin it doesn't protect the discs as much. And what do we do? Well, we constantly pick stuff up. And how do we pick stuff up? Well, we bend over and pick it up. Then we bend over and pick it up. Then we bend over and pick it up. And then maybe we go weightlifting and we bend over and we pick it up. And we don't have good form when we're doing deadlifts, okay? If you ever watch those gym fail videos and you watch those individuals doing deadlifts and they're just bending their back really bad, well, that's bad news bears. They're going to give themselves a disc herniation eventually. And they're basically just pushing their disc posterior. So what does that look like? Well, let's draw an intervertebral disc, okay? So first, let's do a vertebral body. Then we have the back part of our vertebral body, okay, like so. Uh, we're going to go over all the anatomy of this, so I'm just going to be real quick with this, okay? All the dark spots there, that's all bone, right? We have a vertebral body transverse process, our lamina, our spinous process, okay? There's other things, pedicles, facets. We'll go over all that here shortly. Your spinal canal is right here, okay? I'll draw that in blue where we can see it, but our spinal canal goes right here and our spine goes through that, okay? Our intervertebral disc is right here, okay? Now the intervertebral disc if I were to look at a top-down view of it, okay, this is more of a sagittal view. Um, let me draw my other vertebral body here, okay? If I were to draw my intervertebral disc from a top-down view, it would look like this. This portion right here is called the annulus, okay? It's a lot, it's a real thick, fibrocartilage that kind of is around here. The inner portion of that uh, intervertebral disc is called the nucleolus pulpus, okay? So this is the nucleolus pulpus, and this right here is the annulus. One of the problems with the annulus is when we do that flexing back and forth and we're picking stuff up and we're having bad posture and we sit all day and we're slumped and we have a not the best posture, Okay, one of the problems that we run into is this right here, we get forces that are pressed onto the disc. So those forces, as we bend forward, as we bend forward, what happens is, is the forces are pressed on the anterior aspect of the vertebral bodies. So this presses downwards, this presses downwards, and then that causes a force here. 
And then if we happen to rotate while we're bending down, then we cause a shearing force with a flexion force, and then that causes damage to uh, the annulus. And that damage can maybe be in the form of a, a, a tear or a small crack. Crack's hard to say because it's fibrocartilage tissue, more of like a tear. And really that occurs because let's say that we're dehydrated. These guys rely a lot on H2O. They get bigger and they swell and they fill up with, with uh, hydration, H2O, when you're good and healthy and hydrated. If you're dehydrated, then not so much. And one of the problems with being dehydrated um, is that you run the risk of damaging this, especially if you're dehydrated and you go and lift up a bunch of stuff and you rotate and you lift and rotate. You call it that shearing action. Well, then that's going to cause a tear. And then that tear eventually is going to lead to this nucleolus pulpus. We like to call this a jelly donut. The annulus is the outside. The inner part is the jelly. Well, this uh, nucleolus pulpus begins to push and protrude outwards. And then it goes farther and then farther. And then eventually it is herniated out of the intervertebral disc itself and is bulging either into the spinal canal or onto the nerve roots, okay? Really important stuff here, very, very brief, but I wanted to give you guys that little bit of a lecture um, to give you a little bit of understanding of how that can affect uh, your nerve bundle uh, coming off of the nerve roots or uh, the caraquani or in just into the spinal canal. And then anytime that happens, there's gonna be inflammation. And when there's inflammation, there's gonna be muscle spasms. When there's muscle spasms, there's gonna be you know, muscle guard, muscle spasms and guarding. And then there's gonna be pain, diffuse pain, uh, potentially radiating pain, which is also called radicular pain. Um, and then it just gets worse on top of, of that, okay? And it just doesn't feel good. Anyone that's ever suffered from back pain, it's not a fun time, okay? All right, so that being said, that's a real brief overview of that. So let's get over to the PowerPoint, and then we can go more in depth into um, the divisions of uh, the spinal cord. Um, not the spinal cord, but the vertebral column. And then we'll talk about that, and then we'll just briefly go over ribs. Okay, cool. Okay, let's start with this. This is from your uh, PowerPoint. Um, I like this image right here just to kind of start off with because it really does a good job of, of delineating out the two uh, subsections of the skeletal uh, system, the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. So you can see that the axial skeleton is everything in that kind of a hazy blue and then um, the appendicular skeleton or our appendages and everything from the scapula and clavicle, the shoulder complex there and out towards our digits or fingers. And then everything from our um, pelvis region and some of the bones of our pelvic girdle, uh, not the sacrum though, is uh, included in our uh, appendicular skeleton. The sacrum is the most posterior aspect of the vertebral column. I forgot to mention that when I lifted the, the model up itself, but we'll go over that here in just a second. Um, okay, so... Uh, right here we see the good division or, or a, a, a good image of a division here. Uh, cervical, 7 vertebrae, thoracic, 12, lumbar, 5, and then in our sacrum we have five uh, vertebral um, bodies that have been fused together. And then our coccyx, which is another four uh, vertebrae that are fused together, really, really, really small. And that's what we call our tailbone, is our coccyx, okay? And you can see um, the intervertebral discs here and uh, how that all looks uh, as far. But you need to know 7, 12, 5. That absolutely you need to know, uh, and that's pretty important, okay? The, in the cervical vertebrae, the top two, which we'll go over here in just a minute a little bit more, but the top two are called C1 is the atlas and C2 is the axis, okay? The atlas, think of that Greek god that's holding up the earth, okay? The atlas is what articulates, remember articulation is a joint, is what articulates with the occipital condyles of the base of the skull. 
if you remember the foramen magnum where our brain stem comes out of, well, C1 has um, uh, basically these uh, large uh, fossas um, that uh, accept the occipital condyles and uh, the occipital condyles rest on top of the atlas there. Okay, uh, this is a relatively good, um, a relatively good uh, ver vertebrae to talk about. Okay, this is one of our thoracic vertebrae, and you could tell it's the thoracic vertebrae because of the transverse processes. They have uh, little tiny facets on the end of them. Those are those divots. The pearly white little sub substance there is the hyaline cartilage or articular cartilage. Um, those divots are the facets where the ribs uh, articulate. So our ribs wrap around and join in. If we go back real quick, um, or if you go back real quick, uh, remember that the thoracic uh, vertebral column is uh, as such that the ribs attach on to the vertebrae. And so where they attach is right here on the transverse process on these facets. Uh, a facet is basically just another name for a fossa or a divot um, that is where another bony uh, protrusion or another bone articulates with um, to create a joint. Uh, so you notice that uh, our main vertebral body is that large portion right there. It's made of spongy bone. And that kind of uh, moves and fuses backwards and kind of forms this circular pattern, this giant foramen, our spinal canal or vertebral foramen. Um, that's where our spinal cord goes through. And then uh, the region right before uh, those other pearly white little fossas or facets, those are the uh, facets that join each vertebrae up and down together. Um, but right before there, that area is called the pedicle, okay? Rare to see a fracture in the pedicle. However, it is possible. Um, sometimes we see fractures in that pedicle that cause uh, a lot of pain. Uh, some soccer players, gymnasts, and football players, especially linemen, uh, sometimes can see that. Usually we see fractures in an area of uh, the vertebral column uh, or the vertebral bone itself, just one vertebrae, in an area called the pars. And you can't see the pars here. You have to hold uh, the vertebrae in what's called an oblique view, uh, a sagittal oblique view, so that you can really identify the pars and look at the pars. But, um, you know, that's not as important uh, for this moment here. Uh, the posterior aspect, most posterior is the trans, or, or excuse me, the spinous process. And then that kind of comes forward and the, and the portion of that where it joins together in that sort of little Y junction where it creates the posterior aspect of the spinal canal uh, is called the lamina. Back in the day when we would do fusions, some doctors still do it, uh, we do a procedure called a laminectomy where they go ahead and cut off that portion right there and put a plate and, and join uh, multiple vertebrae together uh, when we do a fusion. Okay, um, so we're looking at uh, the atlas and the axis. So you can see the atlas and the axis together. The atlas is the first vertebrae. That's where uh, the condyles sit on top of. And then the axis is the second vertebrae. And the atlas actually spins around, allowing us to say no, right? Spins around the axis. Uh, being able to say yes, up and down, head moving up and down, that occurs at the atlas and also the subsequent vertebrae down below C3, C4, C5, that causes that um, or helps to assist in flexion and extension of the cervical spine. Okay, uh, all the way to the uh, left side of the screen is a typical cervical vertebrae. Okay, one thing that is really uh, important about cervical vertebrae is number one, their vertebral bodies are a lot smaller. The intervertebral discs are a lot smaller. A lot less disc herniations occur in this region, although it still happens. It's the second most out of uh, the three major regions of the spine, um, lumbar being first, cervical being next, thoracic, 
hardly rarely see uh, disc pathology in thoracic, although it can happen, but it's very rare, mostly because of the amount of support and structure and stability that is seen at uh, the thoracic vertebrae, and that's because of the ribs, okay? Another thing that's really important to denote with cervical vertebrae is the two tiny holes next to the main vertebral body, okay? So you see the vertebral body and then the two tiny holes. These two tiny holes are so that our um, cervical arteries can go through. And this goes up, and this is only our cervical vertebrae has this, and this goes up and supplies blood to the brain and enters into an area of uh, the blood supply of the brain or a uh, complex of arteries in the, in the brain uh, called the circle of Willis, okay? Um, all right, so transverse uh, processes are very unique here in the thoracic vertebrae. Okay, these are examples of the thoracic vertebrae. You can see that they're very much different from the cervical. Uh, the, on the transverse process of the thoracic vertebrae are the rib facets or costal facets. Okay, it's for the regions of the ribs to come up and meet and articulate with the thoracic vertebrae. Remember, only the thoracic vertebrae has the ribs that articulate with it, increasing stability. Now, you're gonna hear this when we talk about muscles, but whenever we have an increase of stability, we have a decrease of mobility. I would write that down if I were you, especially if you're an exercise science major, because that concept is gonna build upon itself as you get into much higher level courses, okay? Like 410, 420, 411, courses like that, all right? So with increased stability, we have decreased mobility. With increased mobility, we have decreased stability. So it's an inverse property of itself, okay? So the thoracic vertebrae is the most stable but it's the least mobile, right? If we try and rotate our thoracic vertebrae, it's gonna be pretty hard because our ribs are holding all of them together. If we try and flex our thoracic vertebrae, once again, that's also gonna be pretty hard because our ribs are holding everything together and we have a lot of fascia, a lot of muscle that tie all those ribs together, okay? And we don't really want that portion of our body to move a lot. Why? Well, because our organs, our vital organs are within our um, thoracic cage, okay? So here you can see the spinous process is uh, much longer in the uh, thoracic vertebrae as compared to um, the cervical. Uh, and then look over here to the left and then notice just the spinal cord. So this is a really good image of the spinal cord to just talk about the shape of it, okay? It kind of has this curved shape. If you think about physics and you think about how uh, physical properties occur as far as dealing with compressatory forces and forces applied onto objects. Okay, one of the best ways, and here's where I'm leading onto this, one of the best ways to explain this is a bridge, right? Way back in Roman times, they used to make bridges and one of the main things in a bridge was it had a giant arch in it. Okay, that arch allowed for forces to be displaced along the longitude of the arch, okay? So uh, a semicircle, a half circle, or an arch really does a good job of displacing forces. Our spine is made up of the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar, and sacrum. Well, they each have their own arch to them, okay? The cervical, arches uh, in one direction that is opposite to the thoracic. The cervical arches in a direction that we call that a lordotic curvature, okay, or lower doses. You can Google this, so you can get a little bit more information on it, but it's a lordotic arch, okay? Our thoracic vertebrae has a kyphotic arch or kyphosis arch, okay? And then our lumbar has a lordotic arch, and then the sacrum has a kyphotic arch, okay? We don't want an excessive lordotic in either the cervical or the lumbar, nor do we want an excessive kyphotic in the thoracic or the sacrum, okay? If you think of 
old men or old ladies, as we get older, we kind of get that hunchback and lean over and our head pops up more and, you know, we kind of get into that weird position. Well, that is excessive kyphosis that occurs, okay? Um, but the arch of the spine helps displace force along the spine um, so that we can handle the load that's placed against our body from gravity, all right? Here are lumbar vertebrae, largest of all the vertebrae, takes the brunt of the force in a lot of the movement that occurs, huge vertebral bodies, and like I said, this is usually where we see the intervertebral disc taking a lot of the punishment, especially with flexion exercises, because it has a opposite direction, that lordotic curvature. We don't want to lose that, and if we end up losing that lordotic curvature, then we really run the risk of having um, some spinal pathologies such as um, uh, disc pathology or disc herniation, okay? Uh, the spinous process are not as long as the spinous process in the thoracic region, uh, but they're very thick, okay? The lumbar uh, vertebral bodies and vertebral uh, bony structures or landmarks are, are a lot larger and thicker, okay? Here you can really see a, a good view of the inferior articular facet or the articular process, and then the superior articular facet. Okay, these articular facets are what join each vertebral body with one another, besides the intervertebral disc, okay? That's really the main joint that allows for that freedom of movement. Um, and this is actually a, what's called a synovial joint. You'll learn more about synovial joints, hopefully in your class. Um, anyway, so this is the lumbar uh, vertebrae. So what you need to know is you need to know the vertebral body, you need to know uh, all the facets, the articular facets, how one vertebrae joins to the other vertebrae, and then in the transverse um, facets in the thoracic vertebrae only, the thoracic vertebrae, the middle 12, um, is where the ribs join together. Okay, so you need to know that. Make sure you review the pedicles, uh, maybe your pars as well, so look that up. Okay, so it's online online learning. So a little bit on you guys to to look some of this stuff up and read your book. I know it's a novel idea to read your book, but you know you have your book. Um, so go ahead and take a gander at that. Okay. Lastly, we have the sacrum and the coccyx. Uh, the sacrum is pretty important. I'll talk about the sacrum a little bit more when we get to appendicular skeleton because the sacrum uh, articulates or joins together not only with the lumbar spine and the coccyx but it also joins together with the uh, um, main pelvic bone uh, or the, of the pelvic girdle, which is what's called the ilium. Um, and the uh, ilium and the ischium and the pubic bone, okay? Really, it's the ilium where it articulates with. Um, but this, the sacrum and the ilium make up a very, very important joint, especially important in healthcare, called the sacral iliac joint. I can't even tell you how many uh, patients, athletes I treat um, that have sacral iliac pathology due to a muscle imbalance of some sort or, or poor movement patterns, okay? Um, so that's one of the most important things about the sacrum when we're thinking of it from a practical standpoint of being a healthcare provider, okay, which hopefully many of you will become. All right, but you can take a look here and uh, go through this and, and look at all of the sites here. You know, I'm not going to read every little structure here, but um, you can you can review it and take notes on it. OK. Um, all right. So like I said, I'm not going to go into ribs too much, most of the same time. And also, um, you know, because we also have that particular skeleton to get through this week. You got a lot going on. Uh, so go ahead and uh, review this. You can look at your ribs. We got uh, one through seven true ribs, your false ribs uh, down below eight through 12. Um, and then uh, one of the most important things about the ribs is a lot of bony tissue is on the ribs, but that slightly different color there, that blue, that is really made up of uh, a hard, uh, thick, what's called costal cartilage, okay? And this helps our ribs be able to move. We want our ribs to move, right? Breathing needs to occur. So our ribs expand outwards, allowing for decreased pressure in our lungs, okay? So then that pressure gradient allows for breathing to occur. Air rushes in as compared to atmospheric pressure. We'll go into that in the last lab. 
Um, but we need our ribs to move uh, so that we can breathe, okay? We have to be able to breathe. In order to breathe, our ribs have to move. So that's one of the main reasons why we have that cartilage, okay? Um, I'll let you go through this and you can see it. We have our sternum, the manubrium, really important top part of the uh, sternum. Uh, and then we have our sternal body. And then all of that kind of connects with our uh, costals or our, our cartilage of the ribs.